Jan Fleming, here is a picture of him, was born in May 28, uh, 1908. So remember this date, because I will uh, mention it later on during this talk. There is a special link with this date. Well, he was born in, in England, and uh, like any future gentleman, he was sent by his parents to Eton. And then his parents wanted to, you know, to enhance his uh, language skills, so he was sent as well to Kitzbühel and to the Munich University in order to have, you know, speak German, to learn how to speak German, and also to the University of Geneva, also to learn how to speak French. But uh, he was not a very good pupil, so he failed to, to pass the entry exam examination to the Foreign Office. So if he started his career not as a diplomat, but that, as a journalist for financial uh, newspapers. So uh, Reuters first, and then he was not very stable. Then we moved to another one two years after, to the financial finances school and co, and then to Roman and Pittman. I will say a little bit more in a minute about what happened to him during World War II, but I will jump to what happened to him after World War II right now. So in 1945, after Second World War, he built a house in Jamaica and he gave a name to this house, Golden Eye. You just heard Golden Eye second ago. And then he became uh, the manager for a, another a uh, newspaper, Kemsley, and he negotiated something very clever. To have three months of holiday per year that he can spend at his house in Jamaica. And that's where he had time to write down, you know, his James Bond novel. So that's where he started. And, uh, well, for good, because now we have a, a new character in the literature. And the first born novel is Casino Royale, which goes back to 1952, and here you have a modern version of Casino Royale. And as you see, well, uh, he was a heavy smoker, heavy drinker, heavy everything, and that shortened maybe not the quality of his life, but its length. And so he passed away uh, uh, quite uh, young, at, uh, in 1964. But what is very interesting in Jan Fleming is also what happened to him during World War II. So during World War II, he became the personal assistant to an admiral, Admiral Godfrey, who was the director of the Naval Intelligence, and became, uh, he, he got this quality already in 1939. And this admiral was a tough person, you know, and not very liked by his other colleagues. So very often he sent Jan Fleming to meet him, saying, well, I don't want to go there. Go there, discuss with them, then come back to me, tell me what they said, and I will tell you what to do. But during this, you know, uh, Jan Fleming le learned a lot and had a lot of connections. And, and a lot, he, very, he was a very productive and very creative uh, uh, guy. He formed, uh, he was behind the, the formation of uh, the so-called 30 assault unit in 1942. He also imagined uh, the Operation Ruthless, which was never implemented, but it already gives the spirit of uh, how Jan Fleming was thinking. And I will tell you what was this Operation Ruthless. Was the idea was to get more machines of Enigma machine. And you know this Enigma machine was the one which was used by the, uh, by the German uh, U-boats uh, submarines to communicate safely. And I will show you one in a second. But what Jan Fleming had in mind was to do the following. So to train uh, British soldiers such that the, the uh, British soldiers would speak fluently German, steal somehow a plane from, from the Luftwaffe, put these, these soldiers in the plane, send this plane over the channel, crash the plane near what you hope will be a new boat, German new boat, send May Day's messages, hope that the new boat will come and save them, then the soldiers would be in the new boat, and then they can gain control of the new boat, and then finally, you know, uh, recover another Enigma machine.
this was never implemented. That gives you an idea of the adventure that was in mind of, of, of Jan Fleming. What is the problem? What I would like to tell you, so that is the motivation, but what I would like to explain to you today, and some of you probably know this problem, is how two people, you know, the problem is two random people who like to communicate. Well, I have prepared this, uh, this series of, uh, of conferences some, some weeks ago, some months ago, so uh, I chose some pictures that were appropriate at that time. I would love to change this picture. But let's see. Okay, we take two random people, so one completely random, and another one. They want to communicate, you see. And so what do they do? They do well, uh, by Frank, they have many plans for the conference. Of course, I'm happy to this, this, kind of, you know, this kind of proposal, but I would like to have some discussion. But it is, this communication is not safe. So that's the problem. How to communicate in a confidential way, safely? How? Well, I will try, I told you, we will try to travel through time and space. So I will start with time and already explain to you what happened up to 2000 years before Christus. Roughly 1,900. So even already at that time, you see, you have non-stop. I wrote here non-standard hieroglyphs in the old kingdom of Egypt. This can be considered as, as a, the first crypto approach, approach to cryptology. Then you have some monoalphabetic substitutions. One of the most famous of them is Caesar cipher. So here I put a picture that you know because you have been at my place. So it is uh, Jean Tiras, one of the drawings of, of a good friend of mine who is uh, a painter. So he made a series about Jules César in 2013. This is one of them. But what is the César cipher? It is very simple. And I will use the alphabet I'm most familiar with, so A, B, C, D, and so on. And, and not necessarily the alphabet if you, if you allow me. So, the, 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 the cipher is very simple. You shift one letter by three to the right. So, A becomes B, let's say, B becomes E, and so on and so on. That's how to encipher, so to encrypt a message. And, of course, to send this message, and when you receive this message, to decrypt, you just shift back three letters to the left, and you've got the message. Okay. That's uh, not a very safe uh, crypto system. I, I, will show, I will tell you something else, which is not cryptology, but which was used. So you take, uh, let's say you have a message, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I would like to meet you in, uh, in uh, let's say, in three months. You will explain why it takes such a long time, three months. You, you will know. So I have to find somebody to tell you this because well, you are on Belarus and we'll be like in well, that's far. So I have to find a slave who has a lot of hair. I will not look at anyone. But then what I need to do is to shave the head. Up. Then I put a tattoo, you know. You know, we, we spoke about uh, footballers, I don't know why, but nowadays you can't be a footballer with, if you don't have a lot of tattoos. So you have... You can't play, I, that's simple. It? But okay, so you have, you have your head, which is shaved, and then I say, well, uh, it will be a pleasure to meet you uh, oh, at the uh, University of Minsk in three months, uh, the same place, the same uh, at 10.50. But then, of course, I have to wait, because the the hair has to grow on the head. Once the hair is, has grown enough, I send the, the slave to you. Then you, you receive the slave and you shave the head again and then you read the message. Then you decide, say, yes, with pleasure. But then you have to wait again to because the hair has to grow and to send me back. So you see, that's a method that has limits. And the limit is the size of the head, because you know after a while uh, there is no space to, to, 
tattoo anything. The speed of, of you know, how fast the, the, the hairs work, and also some other limits. You know, so that's complex. But that was used. That was used uh, back to the time of, of Herodotus' uh, reports about, about this. Okay, but that's not cryptology. That's more information hiding for those of you who know uh, this aspect. So that's not crypto. But if you have something like Caesar's cipher or some other ciphers of the same kind, then what, what you can do is you make a statistical analysis. So you can, in any language of the world, like French, for instance, I'm French, the, in, in French, the letter which is the most used is the letter uh, E. So then you measure, in, if you have a message which is long enough, you will, you will see what is the symbol that occurs the most. Then you will guess, okay, that's probably this letter. And then what is the second one which occurs the most at service? And then you have some statistical distribution that you can apply, and then you can guess the message, and you can see, well, is it a good message, yes or no? So this is the frequency crypto, crypt analysis, if you want, based on the different languages, and then you can get studies and so on. Well, there are lots of uh, stories around this, and I will not spend too much time on this. What I would like to tell you is, uh, I jumped from, you know, uh, slaves and uh, Caesar to uh, World War II. And uh, I told you about already the Enigma machine. So this is one Enigma machine here. And uh, the, the Polish people, uh, Marian Hayevski in particular, did a lot of work on, on this machine, even prior World War II. But when they notice that there is a limit in, in uh, what they can do in this time, and they, they knew that the Germans were going to, you know, to, to attack, so they passed on their results to, to two countries, the French and the, and the British, independently. And in Great Britain, it, it led ultimately to the creation of a Bletchley Park and Alan Turing uh, working on this machine. Maybe you have seen, there is a very a movie which was uh, shot recently about Alan Turing's uh, life and his work uh, towards the Enigma machine. So that's Enigma. Here you have another system which, is, uh, which was developed during the 19, mid of the 1970s and uh, it is called, called the DES. DES means Data Encryption Standard. When you see a FIPS, it means Federal Information Processing Standard. So it became a standard from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 1977, and there were different releases of this, of this standard up to 1999. For the experts in the room, well, they know perfectly that this uh, uh, DES is a block cipher with 16 rounds and a, a key of length, uh, 64 bits, but actually 56, because there are 8 bits which are, um, which mean, enfin, they, they, they are redundancy bits, so you can deduce them from the others. <coughs> But already in 1999, it was clear that that was the end of the DES because a DES cracker was built. So special, specially designed chips were made to attack the DES. And uh, this cracker was, uh, the price was less than $1 million roughly at that time. And uh, can, can crack one DES key within, uh, in average, a couple of days something like that, if my memory is not uh, too bad. The point was to say that's the end of the DES. We need a new, a new standard because you know, we will not be successful in, in continuing with this, uh, with this crypto system. And that gave birth to a new, uh, a new race for a new standard, the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. So I had the chance, chance for the penalty during a while to observe very closely this, uh, this advance about the AES. And uh, uh, at the end it was a, 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 a proposal from Belgium that, that won the competition. 
And this is, in a way, the, the design of the AES, so the Advanced Encryption Standard, which goes back to 2001. It is again a block cipher with speeds of different lengths, larger than the ones before, but uh, and using more more mass metrics, more arithmetic in finite fields. Actually, the field is here. The field is given here. This is symmetric key cryptology. So what is symmetric key cryptology? How does it work? Well, OK, you remember here I have my good friend Claudia, who wants to beat me absolutely after the conference. But she wants to send it in an encrypted way. right? So what she does, she will use a secret key and an encryption algorithm to send her message to me. This is the encrypted message. And here, OK, with the decryption algorithm and the same key, I get the message, I am happy. But you see, you have one key which does it all. One single key to encrypt, to decrypt the same key. That's the symmetric key cryptology. One key. Is it sufficient? Are there problems? Or no. But the point is, yes, there are problems. But it's not completely sufficient. And there are three main problems. <coughs> there are more than that, but the three main problems. What are they? The initial key exchange, the key management, and digital signature. These are the three main problems. And I will try to illustrate to you the three problems so that you can understand where the limits are with, with this approach. Initial key exchange, you remember? One key does it all. So that we have to agree on the key. So for instance, okay, Claudia can tell me the key is this, so she can tell me, she can call me and say, well, the key will be this. She can send it to a post, you know, or use, use a pigeon or whatever. But she has, we have to agree on a key. But it's not a very safe way to agree on a key. That's problem number one. Now problem number two. Key management. <coughs> Complex problem. Imagine you have many random people who want to communicate. Again, wrong. I have to relax when I prepare, so I relax. Yeah? And they want to communicate with each other. That's already a complex situation. But that can be worse. Yeah, that's awful. That's awful. You need all these keys, but of course, imagine you and I, we have one key, but Alexander and Mr. Director, they have also a key. But they have the same as we have. So that's not good because they will listen to what we say, but that's not good for the either because they will listen to what they say. So the keys have to be different. How many different keys does it mean? What do you think? The group like our group here. Yeah. I don't know, there are many other keys. So you need, when you have n people, you need n times n minus 1 divided by 2 different keys. So the other magnitude is n squared divided by 2. It starts to be huge. So you have to create these keys, to send these keys, and to be sure that they are distinct. But what happens if of, of somebody, for instance, uh, let's say this, uh, this lady here, you can't trust her anymore. She's not a good person anymore. So you have to get rid of all these keys to, you know, you have to make sure and to inform the others, don't trust this person anymore, and so on and so on. Key management. What happens if I lose the key? If, for instance, I have stored the messages in an encrypted way and I don't have the keys anymore, I have a big problem. I don't know what the messages are anymore. I can't get it. I'm sorry. See, key management. Complex problem. Digital signature. Ah. Uh, yeah, imagine. I receive a message, dear friend, do you have anything planned after your conference? Well, yeah, imagine it comes from you. But uh, actually, it doesn't. 
comes from this gentleman. Do you know this gentleman, by the way? May I introduce you? This is Ernst Savro Blofeld. He appears in the film as in Royale, of course. He is a bad guy in James Bond stories. And I told you to remember the birthday of Ian Fleming. The reason is that, well, Ian Fleming gave him the same birthday in his pictures, in his novels. And I have a small anecdote. I gave this lecture already at the uh, Politecnica University in Moscow. And in the audience, which was as large as this one, there was also the president of the Association of Alumni of the Warsaw University of Technology. And I told him, this is one of your, of your alumni, because in the book it is said that this guy made a, 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 a mark, the equivalent of a master at the Politecnica. So he was not aware of this uh, former student of this university. So that's the bad guy. So imagine I receive a message. I believe it comes from, uh, you know, I go, I go to the place and I am killed by this guy. So that's not good. So I have to be sure. Hmm? I have two times, I am two times disappointed. First, because it is not the lady that I expected. Second, because I am killed. It's not good at all. So, symmetric key cryptology is good up to a point. We have, we have three serious problems that I have described now. So, what to do? What to do? Well, think differently. So, remember, I told you, symmetric key is you have one key that does it all. To encrypt, to decrypt. But is it necessary? You need to have the same key to do the two operations. Imagine now that you are that the situation is different. You have two keys, not one, two. One to encrypt, one to decrypt. So you will say, well, that's at least two times more complex than before, because I have two keys instead of one. But actually it turns out to be wrong. The situation is much better. I will explain you why. So imagine you have two keys, a public key to encrypt and a secret key to decrypt. So the public key will be known by all who will send a message to you and the secret key will be known only by you to decrypt the, message you will, the messages you will receive. But the two keys are not independent from each other, of course. They have to do something with each other. And they are mathematically linked. So that's where mathematics comes in the game. But they, they should, the mathematical link should be in such a way that knowing only public data, so the public key or even encrypted messages, you shouldn't be able to, to find the, key, the secret key. Okay? So I will try to explain to you this concept. Here we are. So again, Claudia, you know, she still wants to meet me after the conference for a group. So she will look in the public key directory where all the public keys are listed. You know, you have uh, a lot of people here. You have myself. So this is the blue key here is my public key. Everybody can look at this. In particular, this young lady. So she picks the public key, no problem with that. She encrypts this message with an encryption algorithm. We will see some later. She sends it away. Okay, this is encrypted. Nobody can a priori find out. And here it is the encryption algorithm. I use my secret key. My secret key. I decrypt the message. I read the message. I am okay. So two keys. But with this key, of course, she can send a message, but anyone can send me a message with the same public key. Only me, with my secret key, I am able to decrypt the message. That's the idea behind uh, this concept. So remember, two keys, 
The big key cryptography means two keys, not one, two. Okay, so, oh yeah, with this problem one and problem two are solved. The initial key exchange, so it'll be more complex, but that's solved as well. We'll see a little bit more later. I will, I will try to illustrate this later. Key management is solved as well. You have to pay attention to the public key directory here. Of course, you have to make sure that it is not accessed by you know, people, in fact, it's not modified by people who are not allowed to modify this kind of constraints and so on, which leads to other, other things like public key infrastructure and companies that do this. But, okay. So key management may be solved, initial key exchange may be solved. What about digital signature? You know, uh, uh, I don't want to be killed. I would like to avoid the signature. So you use here the same approach. So you have, again, the bad guy who wants to, you know, to fake, uh, to send me a fake message. But of course, he has to sign. Actually, he pretends to be a young lady called Claudia. She's a big Claudia. Okay, he pretends to be Claudia. She's a big Claudia. Now, this way you can see that the point on the other side of the internet, you know. So, what he will do, he will try to sign the message, but of course, he doesn't know the secret key of Claudia. So, we. Yes, we take a random key. Okay. Send a message and that's his sign message. So we have a message and the signature is in the message inside. I get this information. I separate the message from the signature. And now I will check if the signature, the message, and, and uh, are compatible with the, pretend, the person who pretends to be behind this message. I use the so-called verification algorithm, which is here. I take the public key of Claudia, which is public, and I check, okay, this public key, is it compatible with the signature? No, 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 no. I don't do now, in the better situation, the message is sent. Claudia uses her secret key. It's sent over. And here, what happens? Okay, I, I take the public key of Claudia and I check is this public key compatible with the signature done with her secret key? Is it compatible? The answer is yes. You see, the pictures differ because it's not the same, of course, but it is compatible. Huh? This is compatible. This is the same person behind. This is what I mean. It is compatible. It works. Okay, perfect. Let's see. So, in principle, at this stage, what happens? We have two problems. The two problems are mainly solved, provided we have a big key algorithms. The concept is okay, but we need algorithms. Do they exist? Are there efficient public key algorithms? Yes. So we have three mainly, there are more than that, but I will speak about three. <coughs> what are they? How secure are they? I will start with Rivers Shamir and Adelman, RSA. So RSA comes from Rivers Shamir and Adelman. This is an algorithm which is used hundreds of millions of times a day. Uh, by the way, we had uh, Adi Shami um, who came to our university during one week, uh, two months ago, something like that. And uh, so in 1977, they developed this algorithm which provides public key encryption, decryption, digital uh, uh, signature. But I told you at the beginning that the, the keys, the secret key and the public key should be mathematically linked. There should be a problem which is hard to solve. And the problem which is here is behind this, which gives a kind of 
of support of security, it is a data factorization problem. That is very simple to explain the problem. The problem. If I tell you 3 times 5, you will very quickly find that it is 15. If I tell you 15, okay, now you know it is 3 times 5. But that work with you speaking is much slower. You can try. I give you two big numbers, two big prime numbers, missing from each other, you will divide them. It's a fast operation. If I give you a big number, which is the product of two prime numbers, find out what are these two prime numbers. That's much, much, much slower. Okay. So the security is based on this, on the integer factorization problem, which is the following. I give you a number, product of two primes, the problem is find the two times. Do you do it? Okay. You can always do it. You try and the number, you will be successful. But quickly, what is quickly? We are then doing a work place. How to do it efficiently? This is the integer factorization problem. We have another class of problems that leads to other, other crypto systems. And uh, DCL key exchange protocol, which is also a way to, to agree on a key on, a, on an open channel. So they developed in 1976, so you see it was mature at that time, the idea of a, of a secret uh, to establish a shared secret over an open, on open channel. What does it mean? It means I tell you something, you tell me something. I tell you something, you tell me something, everybody listens, but at the end, you and I, we have a secret. Nobody knows. Interesting. No? So, and the security is based, by, uh, is based on the discrete of every problem. Which is another class of problems. But the, the interest of this problem, I will not really tell you what the problem is, not today. But is that you can write this problem in a lot of, not only for, for in one situation, but for many. You have many, many so-called groups in the mathematical sense on which you can write this problem. So you don't have only, you know, with integer factorization problems, you have only, as a structure, you have only primes. That's a lot, but that's all. Here you have all the groups you can think about. Now out of all the groups, there are probably some that can lead to very good crypto systems. And actually what they propose is to use the group which is called FP star, Z over P, Z minus zero, where P is a prime. Okay, we can mean again, one, one prime comes and I'm here. Primes, you, you will use them all the time, they are like uh, atoms of numbers. So they propose this, this kind of they propose this kind of group F P star. So it is Z over P Z minus zero, <coughs> where P is a prime, is a finite cyclic group of order P minus one. But is it secure for P prime for large prime up to a point? And I will tell you up to a point what it means in a second. But before this. You have, you see, you have RSA and DFL man over FP star, and both are subject to attacks. Which means, when you have a number of product of two primes, you find the two primes in sub exponential complexity. So you can find it. And the same with this real world problem. You can solve the discrete real problem of FP star in sub exponential speed. So are there some other groups where maybe you can use the same discrete log problem, the same problem, but on another group where the difficulty to solve the problem is, is harder? And the answer is yes. And it goes back to 1985, maybe. It is the, uh, the AT curve cryptology, so Kovitz and Miller developed this approach. And they propose to use AT curves, find the flat fields, take subgroups of those which are secret, and consider the discrete problem 
is the following, the best general tax, general uh, tax, analytic curves are, actually they are generic, they are not specific. Generic in the sense that they do not exploit the fact that you have analytic curves, you just exploit the fact that you have a group. And they work in exponential time, so they are much slower, which means that the security is better. I said in general that, and I said also that's almost it. The reason is that there are two other attacks that are very specific, very particular curves that work in very, very efficiently, very, very efficiently. But uh, it's very narrow class of, of, of attacks, so uh, very difficult to implement. Enfin, very difficult. To, you need deep mathematics, by the way very deep mathematics to attack those. But okay. So, today, generally speaking, you have no general attack with a LT curve discrete log problem which works in less than exponential complexity. So what does it mean? Well, where are we today? Public key cryptography relies on mathematical problems. Integral factorization problem, discrete log over FP star, discrete log over LT curve, some other problems. But you have always a mathematical problem behind. So you need strong mathematics to do crypto. In terms of security, you have sub exponential tax and exponential tax. What does it mean? I will give you just this, um, this diagram here, which illustrates the difference between the two attacks and, and the two approaches. If you take RSA and you fix the level of security, let's say, with 1024 bits, which is the size of the numbers you will consider, 1024 bits, quite large. So you say, okay, that's the level of security. The fastest to break this system, to break this system with 1024 bits, I need this amount of effort, okay? Now, if you use elliptic curves, what would be the amount of effort, what would be the size of the parameters in order to have the same level of security? And this is given in the diagram. So you see, you are here. Well, if you go down, you will see you have only 163 bits. So with 163 bits for elliptic curves, you have the same level of security as with 1024 bits for RSA. Now imagine you double the level of security. You jump from 1024 to 2048. You are here. Again, question, what is the size you need for elliptic curves in order to achieve the same level of security? Boom, 224. You didn't double. You didn't double, you didn't do 2 times 163, you just added some bits. The reason is because the, the, in one case you have exponential complexity, the other one you have sub-exponential complexity. That's why you have this difference. If you triple, you go from 1024 to 3072, you go here and here, you have only 256 bits. Small. So D. This diagram tells you why elliptic curves are important nowadays. This comes from this. Okay? So this difference of complexity is very, very important for security purposes. Okay. You choose one of those, RSA, DFLMAN, or whatever. Are, are we done? Are all the problems done? Remember, you need a crypto system. Are we done? No. No, no, we are not already in the happiest world you can think of. Why? Because security cryptology is most of the time, in fact, it's up to 100 times slower than secret key cryptology. So if you want to encrypt something, with one of those, it is slow. So 
What do you mean? So where are we? We have symmetric key cryptology, which is fine up to a point. We have three main challenges. Uh, initial key exchange, key management, digital signature. There are public key crypto systems that can solve these challenges, but they are slow. So on the one hand, it is fast, but you can't address all the problems. On the other hand, you address the problems where it's near, but it is slow. So what to do? Be greedy, they call. They call. And see what happens. Don't choose either or, choose both. So, I will tell you uh, in the next slide, it's probably the most complex slide of all. But, uh, well, it tells you the thing about combining the program community and security. So, let's see how it works. Here we are. We are, as we met today, we are 7 o'clock in the morning. Claudia, right. 7 o'clock in the morning, she wants to communicate with me during the whole day. Claudia is, uh, let's say, means here. I am in the books. 7 o'clock in the morning. Claudia wakes up, presses the button, computer on, off. And then, what does she do? She looks in the public key directory here. <coughs> yeah. My public key is 7 o'clock in the morning. This is your purpose. And then, using my public key, she will encrypt the message that she will send to me at 7 o'clock. What will be this message? It will be this black key. Okay. She decides upon the black key. And she increases this using my public key and the public key cryptography. And I say if they are not what Ah, she sends this. This is the black key encrypted. Okay? That's the black key. This is sent here. And then, at 7 o'clock, I receive the message. I decrypt the message using my secret key, red key, which is linked to the blue one, and I get the black key back. Okay. It is 7 o'clock 1, and we have used public key cryptology to share the black key. So both of us, Claudia and I, will have the back here. Okay. And now, that's all for the day with the big key cryptology. 7 o'clock 2. Claudia, uh, I would like to meet you well after the conference. Ah, and she encrypts this. With the back key, with secret key cryptology, with a key of the ADS license. And she sent it. It's very fast now because we use symmetric key cryptology during the rest of the day. She sends it to me and I say very good, very good, but now I'm going to have breakfast, so I call you and uh, I send you a uh, message in 10 years. And I print this answer in, with the black key. Send it to her very fast. She says yes, hurry up because, uh, you know, I don't have the whole name of me, blah, 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 blah. Send it to me. And I say, okay, hurry up. Uh, Black, 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 black. The whole day until, uh, until whatever. With the symmetric key. So now the advantage is that we use something which is very, very quick during the whole day. Yeah. So the, 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 the point of using you know, symmetric key cryptology now is getting. We have the best of the two worlds. At the very beginning, we agree on what key we will use for the ADS, let's say. During the day we use it, and then we say, well, at the end of the day, we, oh, but at, at, the end of, at the end of the day, 
That's the end of the validity of that key, for instance. And the next day, we restart. Next day, I send on her one, boom, she starts again. Okay, you see? So, here we have used the cryptology once at the very beginning. So, even if it is slow, we use it only once. And for a short message, right? <coughs> Such a key is a 128 bits to 256 bits, it's very short. Okay? Clear? Clear. So, I told you, promised to you uh, roughly uh, 4,000 years of story, going back to uh, slaves with, uh, you know, hair, and uh, to a uh, secret key and then public key. What is really amazing, I find, is that, you know, symmetric key cryptology was used during <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of years, up to 1975 maybe, where people had in mind, do we need the same, the same key to do the, the third version? And this is at this point where it's very simple line, do we need this Ask yourself this question, do we need What happens if not? That leads to this new public key cryptology. It's a major achievement of the 20th century. We will see what the first is, but it's really a major, major achievement. But it still hides some secrets. Let's go back to England. 1919. 1919, UK founded the Government Code and Cypher School. And we will go to it changed its name in 1946. And uh, now the headquarters are located again some, somewhere else in Cheltenham, Gloucester. That's all this is really known. That's uh, so called donut, so that's the GTH. But in 1997, so remember, RSA, the Vietnam, and so on, it was already here. Uh, but in 1997, there was an official disclosure from the British GTHQ. They knew already in 1973. Three people, James Ellis, Clifford Cox, and Malcolm Williamson, they found the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. They developed a version of RSA, and it was considered a milestone. So now we are getting to an end. You may well. The question. I hope. <laughs> but of course I have one clap. Wow. Shaking your skin. Thank you very much for your attention.